Um, so these are uh, more of an introductory session. There's measures you want to go through these in? I'm talking a lot. You can see it here. Um, okay, so the non-directive approach with the K educational guidance and redirection and um, offering that as a choice, that there will always be a choice um, when people don't want to look at something or they notice that there is some kind of hesitation or um, there, there will always be a choice that we offer. Um, and to set aside expectations, use beginner's mind, sometimes just uh, the idea of surrendering and using your breath. And that's also for the therapist too, um, tracking your own experience, uh, using beginner's mind, non-judgmental. We explain that to the um, study subject that we try to be non-judgmental. And, um, and then the idea that there'll be session, uh, uh, periods of inner focus, um, especially in the beginning, after we um, offer them the medicine, we suggest that people stay inside for the first hour um, with headphones and eye shades if they are willing. Um, sometimes people don't want to have head, some headphones or eye, say, eye shades, so we say we have the music on in the room. And then at the hour point, we always um, check in. So we tell them if you have been inside the, for the first hour, we'll check in with you and see where you are. Um, and that we have an agreement to bring up a trauma if the um, person has not brought it up. Uh, and we do that um, you know, very gently. And uh, we've never had to do that in the past. Um, and so, as you can see, basically, a lot of the introductory session is telling people what we're going to be doing. Because it's quite different from most therapy that they've experienced. So we really want to orient, orient them toward this approach so it's not confusing to them when we're asking you know, when we're to go inside or when we're not saying it except stay with it. We really want to orient them for this whole idea of staying with whatever's coming and trusting their inner healing intelligence. Yeah, providing support and encouragement for staying present, um, even with a difficult experience. And so we'll say uh, often, maybe go into the experience, whatever you're feeling, and exaggerate it as much as you can, using your breath and uh, noticing it in your body, um, being curious about it, um, about past experiences, whatever's coming up in your body. And that we don't have to always talk about traumatic experiences if fun things or fun memories of childhood, anything like that where they want to talk, talk about their marriage. I mean, anything in their life we can talk about. Their pets. Pets are very often one thing that is a very positive thing in their life, so um, pets. Um, yeah, and encouraging release of uh, tightness and, and uh, pains in the body sometimes. Oh, okay. I can't do this. Okay. So we, we tell them that we're going to be asking them about what's happening in their body. And we sometimes work directly with it, which we'll talk more about later. But we want to let them know that we're going to be inquiring about the body. We're going to be trying to include awareness of what's happening in the body. Um, and then, um, so we, we talk about physical touch. And um, we want to make sure we have a really clear agreement about that, um, because this is a big issue for most people, but especially a lot of people that have had, had trauma and PTSD. So we tell them, you know, if you don't want to be touched at all, that's fine. Um, if, you, if there are any times when you'd like us to give you some nursing touch, put a hand on your shoulder, hold your hand, hug you, you know, we're open to that. It's totally optional. If you ever want that, 
um, and then it's happening, you suddenly don't want it, we want you just to say stop, and to use that specific command, which we learn in breath work, <laughs> and so there's no confusion. Um, and so we talk about kind of two kinds of touch, that sort of nurturing touch that can be very corrective if you're re-experiencing the time when you didn't get that, when you didn't get the nurturing you needed, and you're deeply connected with that in this non-ordinary state, if you can have a corrective experience at that time, that can be very powerful. So we just let them know that that's an option, and we also you know, let them know there's not going to be sexual touch, which um, it's interesting how many times people have been harboring a concern, you know, that this is a love drug, and maybe all of a sudden they'll all be having sex. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we let them know that that's not you know, um, that if we say, you know, if sexual feelings come up, we want you to be able to let us know and talk about those, but we're not going to act on them. Um, and then um, we talk about another kind of touch that we usually don't use in MDMA sessions. We sometimes do. It's, it's basically the approach we learned in holotropic breath work. Uh, more often, we use it in the follow-up sessions. And that's still a minority of the time, but kind of a significant minority of the time. We may do some direct body work on that. But we let people know that you know, we're going to be encouraging to let their body express and release the energy that's there, and sometimes having us give some resistance and allow them to push against us and, and magnify it so the body stuff can clear, that's another option for touch. And I think one thing with the veterans is the um, idea that their anger is going to get out of control and their rage. So in the MDMA sessions, we found that just using pillows around them and they can squeeze the pillows has really been effective. We never had to do mat work um, in this study until the integration sessions. And then we have done some mat work to release energy after the sessions. So um, we talked about that. They feel like they got to get out of here. Um, we work with that. Take inside. it inside. Yeah. Um, and we kind of generally nurture, try to help them nurture this idea of trust in their own inner healing tone. It's not easy for them to do, but we want to introduce the idea in the introductory sessions. So hopefully they'll encounter it later and recognize it. Um, um, we talk about uh, the use of music and let them know we're going to be, that music is optional, they can ask for quiet, but we will do use music to help kind of support the unfolding process. The other thing um, we talk, talk about in the introductory sessions is the food that they would like to have, like a snack in the afternoon, and try to find out what they like so that we can have things that are nurturing and, and feel comfortable and at home. And then we talked about teaching them a relaxation technique, um, about the possible involvement of a significant other, and again, elicit and answer their questions and ask about their concerns. So we've really covered all that. Um, good. Onward. So the experimental session. Um, this is much more, you know, these are much longer, yet there are only 15 um, adherence criteria, whereas there are like 23 for the introductory sessions. And that's because this is harder to define. Um, and it's more, um, uh, there's more flexibility. You know, you really need to cover all those things in the introductory sessions. Um, and these are more like actual general general principles. And some of them are just like repeating what we told them we were going to be doing. Um, you know, create it and communicate safety and support, comfortable, private, aesthetically pleasing setting, medical safety, um, you know, our body language and whether we're focusing on them is a big part of this. You know, we don't um, get other stuff done when their eyes are closed. And we uh, don't we really we try to text. be there. The only time we text now is we sometimes text each other. 
because we used to pass notes across and then we realized we could actually text each other. But that's, that's pretty rare, rare. Mm -hmm. uh, too. Um, any, we do tell them that any, because we have other people in the study who are not there at that time, we tell them that Annie's going to have her phone on vibrate. I'll have my phone off. And that the only time that she would ever go respond to something is if it's another person that needs immediate attention. So they, we let them know that ahead of time. Um, and we just, you know, do our best to communicate kind of a calm, empathic presence. Sometimes we do better than others, no doubt, but that's our intention. Um, so here's where we do the sessions. Um, it, it's a very private room. It's a small house that was made into offices. There's one other psychiatrist that has an office there. Um, but they're in his office in two doors between the front of the building and this. Um, it's a pretty good space. Two skylights so there's a futon. Um, so the tree, you can see the trees if it's not too bright. Oh. And there's a um, bathroom behind the blue chair. And so. then on the other side is the mu music and the blood pressure machine. Um, and I usually sit over there. Um, people come at 9.30 in the morning and they do the urine screen and the two uh, blood pressures and pulses and temperatures. And then we'll check in and see if there are any fears or concerns or anything that's come up the night before, any dreams or anything like that that they just want to talk about. Um, and then we usually offer the capsule around 10. Um, yeah, and we, have, we do have two cameras running at all, all the time, both in the experimental session and the introductory and follow-up session. So we, um, People get used to that pretty easily, but we do tell them um, if there's ever a time when you think that cameras are inhibiting you from talking about what you want to, we'll turn them off. Because we say, you know, the, the video is important for research and training purposes, but it's secondary to you having the, the experience you to have. And we've done that, you know, periodically. It's not usual, but it's not rare either. We're fine with, with doing that. And if it happens, usually people talk for a while and then they say it's okay to turn back on. The other thing we do um, that I do, I always offer like animal cards or runes. Um, it's not part of the protocol, but it's really nice to get people oriented towards something other than the rational mind. And um, so it, it it's really nice. I mean, some people will say, no, nah, I don't want to do that. But most of the people have really liked it and really found it useful. And they'll spend a little bit of time talking about the meaning. And sometimes they'll want to read it after it so it doesn't influence their session. But it's been really nice. I mean, it brings in the uh, Native American tradition. Kind of helps with the anxiety ahead of time, too. And then we, you know, Maybe after 15 minutes, after they take the capsule, then we really encourage them to go inside and just focus inward. Um, so here, here's some examples of what we, these are quotes we've taken from the videos. You know, we make it explicit, we remind people at the beginning of the session, we want to reaffirm our commitment to be present with you, support you with whatever comes up. Um, we want to make this a safe place for you to have whatever experience comes. Um, and if something, reminding them, if something difficult comes, we're going to encourage them to stay with it as much as they can, fully experience it, use their breath to stay with it. And again, it's always an invitation, an encouragement, not a command. Because if they're, if they're whatever you want to call it, defenses, or I would call it protectors, don't want to let them do that, then we respect that. And we encourage them to get curious about that protector. Um, we say, I'll say, ask us for anything you need. Um, and, you know, people with PTSD, a lot of us have trouble asking for what we need, but um, the people we've worked with in these studies, that can be a particular challenge. So we want to really make it explicit. 
Um, and then, you know, reminding them that we're going to encourage them to have alternating periods of inner focus, alternating talking to us. And there's no set schedule for that. It varies tremendously from person to person and from session to session with, with the same person. But we think both are important. And um, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, again, as we said in the introductory <coughs> session, we'll remind them as much as possible to have a beginner's mind that, you know, we talk about intentions with people ahead of time, which can be very useful. But then we say, you know, what we mean by intention is different from an agenda. That um, obviously you have an overall intention to heal your PTSD or you wouldn't be here. Um, and you may have other intentions and that may change or develop, you know, from session to session. But then we always encourage them to be, sort of bring that to mind, be aware of the intention, and then hold it as lightly as possible so that there, there's no agenda and, and that, to realize that um, the way they're moving toward that intention or according to that intention may not be obvious. You know, that their idea or our uh, rational idea of what it would look like to have that intention of, um, say, um, you know, working with uh, the way the PTSD has affected their relationship the way the MDMA and their, or their inner healing intelligence with the MDMA goes to that goal or that intention may be quite different. Apparently maybe more circuitous or seem to be not going that direction at all. But if you stay with it, usually you find out, oh yeah, wow, that's how it needed to happen. Our rational minds probably would never have come up with that. But their inner healing intelligence will take them there. So we, that's the kind of attitude we encourage in relation to the tensions. The other thing is is to see the the session as as a whole, but to see the whole study as a whole, it's a whole healing process. And so they're on a road of healing. And they might not get to everything in that session. It's going to unfold and emerge over weeks. Um, and to view anything that comes up, I think Angelus Arians talks about that, view anything that comes up as part of your process. So anything on the way to the study, you know, uh, that's a, something that's being brought up for healing, being brought into your awareness. Things that happen with us, it's being brought up for you to heal. Yeah, even if it's like, I'm not doing this right, I'm not having the experience I need to have, that's obviously a dynamic that is part of the healing process, not that they're having the wrong experience. They're having the experience they need to have at that time. Um, they just wouldn't have predicted that. So one example of, of that, um, the experience coming up that um, the woman um, the woman ate before she came for the session. And we, you know, not supposed to eat um, for 12 hours before. and. So she came and she told us she'd eaten breakfast. And so she took the medicine. We, we decided she was from out of town and we decided to go ahead with it um, since she was so far away from home. And she took it and for an hour and a half or two hours, no medicine, no experience. And she started to revisit how her life was like that. Disappointment, disappointment after disappointment from, you know, not having birthday parties, um, on and on and on. Just and she processed disappointment for about forty-five minutes, and then the medicine came in, and it was like so perfect, like exactly what she needed to see. Um, so it was a really good example. So just these are just some more quotes of the kind of thing we say. You know, we trust your inner intelligence will bring what you need. It's much more reliable than anything we can feed ahead of, ahead of time with our rational minds. Um, same thing, we encourage you to approach whatever comes up, it's coming up as part of your healing process, and that the process starts before the MDMA session and goes on long after the MDMA session. So we really enforce that point of view, too. Um, 
That's a nice quote, but I think we'll. No, I mean, I think we'll read this now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see guys out of the dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> In our case. You didn't even have to text. No. What <laughs> <laughs> would happen if I had celebrity nowadays? Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a quote from Young that kind of speaks to this. I found you, I found you where I least expected you. You climbed out of the, of the dark shaft. You took away where I thought to take hold. And you gave me where I did not expect anything. And time and again, you brought me, you brought about fate from new and unexpected quarters. Where I sowed, you robbed me of the harvest. And where I did not sow, you gave me fruit a hundredfold. And time and again, I lost the path and found it again, where I would never have foreseen it. At every decisive moment, you let, you let me believe in myself. That's what we've been trying to say. <laughs> okay. um, and we've already talked about having a non judgmental attitude, not pathologizing experience. Um, physical touch. We've talked about that. Um, we do, you know, at the beginning of the session, we kind of we reiterate that and we ask them how they're doing with our distance. Are we too close? Are we too far away? We really kind of give them a direct example that, that we want to know what feels right to them. Because, you know, if, if you don't, they're apt to just suck it up. And you'll find out later that they were really, really uncomfortable that we were too close or that we were so far away they didn't feel cared for. Um, so, concise communication that the patient needs to follow, as most of you probably know, NDMA can make it hard to track long communications. So this is one of my challenges. Um, so this is one thing. I, I was going into what I thought was a pretty concise <laughs> comment, and the person said, like halfway through, you lost me. I stopped listening a few sentences ago. Um, and usually with NDMA, that's said with a smile. You know, so we really talk to people about, we're not going to take it personally. You know, we're going to say things that are wrong. We're going to say things that aren't clear. We know that's going to happen, and we want you to let us know we don't take it personally. And, and the other know, part of that sentence is, I stop listening. I mean, sometimes they will say, I noticed I wasn't listening to you at all. And, um, you know, it might be about some transference, that they block everything a woman says or everything a man says. And it'll, it'll be key if they're willing to tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, you know, happily, MDMA tends to help people be pretty forgiving to the therapist, so we do the best we can and <laughs> we get by with, you know, we, we, we repair whatever happens that isn't, isn't helpful. Um, and so and examples of how we do this is if people, been, somebody's been talking for a while, we might say, you know, this might be a good time to go back inside and just be present with that or let the medicine and your healing intelligence take where you need to go with that. Um, so often we will suggest that, but once people get the hang of it, they may say, okay, time for me to go back inside now. Like people will have their head eye shades on, they'll pull their eye shades up and say, I want to tell you something. And they'll tell us what they've just experienced and they'll say, okay, it's time to go back inside and pull their shades <laughs> down and then come back out when they're ready. It's, Pretty nice when that happens. Um, so, in terms of this idea of helping them stay with difficult experiences, um, you know, we encourage them to use the breath, uh, which is on the next slide. We encourage expression of whatever's happening with, you know, maybe talking about it, but about it, but maybe letting your body move or sounds, crying, yelling, barking, growling however it needs to be expressed, toning, we encourage all that. And, you know, we 
try to normalize that because sometimes people are, um, think that's pretty crazy, but we tell them not to us. And we tell them we've done a lot of that ourselves. We've seen a lot of it. We've sat with a lot of people in breath work and in this work. And you know, sometimes we talk about when I've been in breath work and you know, shaking for half an hour and and he's been sitting for me and getting nervous and then the facilitator comes by and puts her arm around Annie and says, Look at that boy unwind. <laughs> <laughs> so it does help to let them know that we're comfortable with all this kind of thing that might come up. We take notes. Um, usually people are, remember it quite well, but sometimes it takes something to jog their memory. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we take sometimes, it varies, but sometimes we take pretty extensive notes. Usually when the person is inside, then we'll write down what just happened and, we'll, and try to write some of it verbatim. Sometimes one of us will write it down at the time so we can catch it verbatim. Um, we sort of switch off the bat and sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. We also have the video and they can have copies of that if they want. Um, so again, staying with typical experience, um, encouraging them to use the breath. I talked earlier about the two ways of using the breath, to relax early on and then later to breathe into the, um, into the emotion using supportive language. So here's an example of later in the session if somebody's having difficult experiences. I encourage you to just be as present as you can with that, with that either confusion, stuck feeling, whatever it is. Feel it as full as you can, as you can and express it any way it may come. And this could be, I'd say, any time from 45 minutes to five hours, roughly. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the beginning of the session can be so different from each person. Some people can be in a lot of fear, some people can be in a revisiting a trauma and feel like they're right there. So with that, sometimes we, we try to have them be present with us too and know that they're in that past experience. Um, sometimes anger will come quickly too. I mean, it, it varies, but yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, we talked about this before encourage them to appreciate the affirming positive experience as part of the healing also humor joy um, comfort um, and here here's some things that people have said about you know that part of it um, I feel a whole deeper level of consciousness calmer peacefulness I don't remember having this my mind has never been at peace like this I never before felt what I felt today. This is afterwards reflecting back on the session. I never before felt what I felt today in terms of love and connection. I'm not sure I can reach it again without MDMA, but I'm not without hope that it's possible. Maybe it's like having an aerial map, so now I know there's a trail. That's what I was talking about. Several people used the map analogy about the first session. I think this person was talking about feeling connected to her family in a way that she felt cut off from. Mm -hmm. um, I got a glimpse of more of what I'm capable of growing into. I'm motivated to keep practicing openness and you know it gets more developed. So that idea that the MDMA experience can be like a template for people have an experience that they haven't had access to and then they have a sense that they can reach it without the MDMA. In a way, I felt connection to the divine. From that point on, that first session, I wasn't afraid anymore. I felt like I felt life went on and on and on. I got the feeling I really belong, and I developed an appreciation for all of me, for all of the parts of me. I decided in the first session, everybody gets to stay, meaning the parts. I'm an all-welcome neighborhood, and the thing I like best, best about this is it's the best adventure ever. My goodness, in here is a vast universe. <laughs> and she really talked about her parts and then went on to integrate parts. Um, she saw them like a cone flower with the petals. 
and the self being in the middle? So as we said, a lot of it with people with PTSD is not these blissful experiences, but they also do come at some time for most people, and it's, it's really valuable. So here's uh, just an example. This is actually the first person in the first study. And we, we use the SUDS rating, not really as an outcome measure, but just to kind of track their level of distress during the sessions mainly to reassure the IRB that people aren't losing it during the session, but it's also kind of interesting. So um, in her first session, she had never taken NDMA or anything like it before. So this first line that starts up at seven, we use a seven point size rating. So seven is the most distress you can imagine. One is no distress. So she started out at the beginning of the first session, maximum distress. She was incredibly anxious about what was gonna happen. Um, at the one at the ninety minute mark, these we yeah that says hours. Well, anyway, somewhere when the, the first time I asked her when the medicine had come on, her suds was actually she said minus fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> but since the scale only went to one, I, I don't know. So she had you know unlike some people who go right to the trauma, her experience was she immediately felt comfortable and hopeful and this loving connection and what she said um, later was what she had told us before you know uh, she had been raped about seven years before she said um, you know I rationally I know that I have a lot to be grateful for I have a loving family my husband supported my kids are doing well but I can't feel any of that and what happened in the first MDMA session, she felt that. She really, really got in emotionally. So she had this tremendously affirming, positive experience that gave her a platform to operate from. And so she, she did have, you can see there's a little blip at three, three time point. She did go to the trauma eventually after a lot of appreciation for all that was positive in her life and had a shift of perspective about the world, then she did process the trauma at some point. But she said, she is another person that said, I got a map, she said, I got a map of the battlefield. So what she said, so she had this, some distress while she was processing the trauma to some degree, and then she it went down, she had a, a really nice finish to the session. So, the next time, and she said, I think next time I'll be able to process the trauma more. So the second session, starting down at one, she came in with no distress. You know, that was great. She came in with no distress, and then she went immediately to the trauma and went up to six. And as you can see, it stayed up for several hours, and she really processed the trauma more deeply, and then it came down at the end of the session. So that's just an example, but that's, you know, <coughs> I wouldn't say fairly typical, because I, I think more often people go to the trauma and have more distress first, but it's not that unusual for it to go this way. The say. other fun thing that happened with her was she said, um, when she came to see us, I'll do anything to heal. Um, I'll even go to Tibet. Uh, I'll go to Tibet. And, and she didn't really know anything about Buddhism or Tibet or have any idea about that, but that's what she said. And then, after when the MVMA started coming on, she lifted her eye shades and she giggled and said, I guess I don't have to go to Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. That was pretty nice for us, you know, because here we are starting the first study, first, 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 session, person, first person, first hour. <laughs> the first session is like, oh, okay. <laughs> this, this is gonna work out. It, it is very gratifying. And it's, it's fun, sometimes the first thing people say are very telling like that or another example would be somebody in the first study who had three uh, placebo sessions with inactive placebo mm -hmm. and, and they were all pretty interesting and useful in a certain way but they didn't really help um, and so the first time she got the full dose of MDMA the first thing she said was about after about an hour and a half she lifted her eye shades and she said control 
it's all been about control. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, went on then for three more sessions to process that. But, like, we didn't have to tell her, you know, mm -hmm. you don't really need to control all these things the way you're doing it. She just saw it herself very clearly, and that all changed. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, and this so person, one more thing about this person, she had um, terrible derealization mm -hmm. and depersonalization, derealization. Derealization. Yeah, and after the first session, she didn't have it anymore. What is derealization? Well, you really don't feel like you're real. Okay. Like the world is not like quite the world real. Is it's not a dissociative yeah. kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's pretty common. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's pretty hard because you. Yeah, she didn't feel like, she felt like that a lot of the time. Yeah, so it's an example of like we tell people, this is not a magic bullet. This is likely to be helpful, but it's probably going to be a process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes something goes away in an instant. And so it's good to be prepared for it not being a magic bullet, but not be close to the possibility that some things are just going to leave. And for her, you know, she had plenty more work to do but the derealization, de it just left. She knew exactly when it left. Um, you know, I, I no, know. that's part of the that's part of the first session. The little one is the little blip. One. Yeah, it's a little. Blip. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. I think it was in the second session. Well, she, she only had two sessions. That was when you were giving two sessions. Yeah. And, and what, she, what happened was she uh, revisited the moment that had started. That was a dissociation that started during the rape. She pinpointed exactly when it happened, re experienced it, and then it went away. That's part of the protocol. They, what, they get randomized to the two, two sessions of the same thing. In the first study, it was inactive placebo or MDMA, full dose. In the VET study, it's one or three doses. Then, uh, um, the month after the second session, they see the psychologists again, measure the symptom levels again, we break the blind, and if they got placebo, then they can go through the whole thing again with MDMA. And that was the, the chart I showed before where people didn't have much change, and then they had a big change. Um, so, as we said, non-directive approach with the occasional guidance or reflection offers a choice. So, an example would be, you know, just asking, would you like to tell us more about that? Um, or, I just noticed your voice has <coughs> changed. Is there something going on that you notice? You know, inquiring rather than saying, you need to tell us more about that. That's you know pretty common in most approaches. Um, again, uh, if we offer something as a choice and the person doesn't want it, we respect that. So here's an example of um, you know we said this might be a good time to go back inside, and the person said I've been stuck inside with this for years, so now it feels like we need to talk about it. <laughs> so we say okay. <laughs> that was not a helpful idea, but um, we, you know, we respect it. Or, or one, one person said that um, it, it was in her, I think, her second session, where she'd been inside a lot the first time, and then uh, the next time she said she wanted to walk. She wanted to get up and walk in the room, and we walked next to her so she didn't fall. And she said, my grandmother was the wisest person I ever know, knew, and she used to walk and talk. And I need to walk and talk. So we did that for probably well over an hour. We just walked back and forth, and she talked, and we walked with her. It's beautiful. So, you know, her inner healer knew better than we did what she needed. As Annie said before, it's really nice when people are anxiety free. That's a very corrective experience. It can be very helpful. But we're not shooting for that. We're trusting their inner healing intelligence to bring whatever needs to happen. And sometimes that's going to be a lot of anxiety. It needs to be felt, expressed, and processed. So we do not have an agenda that they should be looking for that sweet spot necessarily. And that they can <coughs> sit through and be with emotion. That's what they've been doing is 
staying away from all emotion. And so the, if you're, you have that opportunity in the session to just be with it in the present time and you say, can you feel the present moment and feel it now? And hopefully they can get the idea that emotion comes and goes. That's what it's like to be human. And so for any kind of emotion, it's, it's wanting them to be with it and watch it move through to something else. People tell us it changed my relationship to my emotions. <clears throat> but, you know, Bob, it, just to be a little more clear about that, it's not that we don't value that sweet spot. We, we really like it when people are having that. It's fun. And they like it. And it's a, it's a good thing. And so on the one hand, yeah, we hope they can have that at some point. But we think that the way there is through the difficulty, often. Not necessarily, you know, that's where the idea of the inner healing intelligence sort of guides us. Sometimes, like this woman, they go right there, and that's great. Very often, they go into the pain first, and they, try, they may try to move away, and they're not going to get there by trying to get there. They're going to get there by as much as possible surrendering to what's coming up or being supported to stay with the pain as long as they need to. And then they'll move through it and then they may have that experience. But I think there's a danger you know, of trying to get to that sweet spot. You know, I'm not saying necessarily, but I think there is that danger, especially since we love the sweet spot, they love the sweet spot. <coughs> if we're trying, if we have an agenda to get to that sweet spot, A, we're probably not going to get there, and B, we're going to miss the route too in that direction, because we're going to not fully help them fully stay with what needs to be processed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 